We are here with Joe Kiani, the founder of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Good evening, Mr. Kiani. I understand that. Oh, thank you. I understand that you have been awarded the 2023 Robert Elwer's Patient Safety Leadership Award. Many congratulations to you. Can you please share with us what started you and this journey to eliminate preventable harm in healthcare? Absolutely. Um, Basically, uh, first, I want to tell you it's been because of people like Dr. Robert Weaver that we are where we are. And uh, it's a great honor to receive this award uh, in his name. What prompted me to take action was a 2011 study that came out of AHRQ, I think, no, it was out of the OIG looking at Medicare patients and the number of harms. And I was shocked that the numbers seemed to be approaching 200,000 deaths a year. This over 10 years after the original article that was the a seminal work called To Air is Human by Institute of Medicine that suggested we're losing 48,000 to about 100,000 people a year to medical errors. And at the time when that article came out, I know a lot of incredibly talented and caring people jumped in to do something. And I thought, great, it's going to get fixed. <laughs> uh, but when I saw that study, I realized it hasn't been fixed or at least not fixed enough. And that it isn't just something for experts to attempt to fix. If it's going to get fixed, it's going to take everybody. It's going to take the village. It's going to take all stakeholders, not just doctors and nurses and patient safety experts, but people making medical technology, engineers, executives, people in regulatory uh, regulating us like the FDA, like the Joint Commission, as well as maybe even more importantly, patient advocates, uh, those who are the North Star for, for us to all remember what we're here for. So that, uh, that prompted me to try to put a summit together and hoping that if the summit works out, we might, we might have a movement. And uh, so the first summit was January 2013. And in the first break, I realized we had started the movement as not just hospitals made commitments to zero, but med tech companies made a pledge to share their data so that hopefully AI and expert systems can be used to detect deterioration before it's too late. That's wonderful. That actually brings me to my next question. You are celebrating your 10th summit this June. Do you still feel that the zero preventable harm goal is, available, is possible? I do. I do. We made a bold goal of zero by 2020, which we did not attain. But that's the only goal. It really, it can't be one, it can't be 10,000, it's got to be zero. And the more I've learned, the more I realize it can be done, or at least get close to zero. There are many preventable uh, deaths that have evidence-based practices associated with them, that if implemented, human errors don't become medical errors, don't become harmful or fatal. And I know of one hospital who implemented all these evidence-based practices, and for six years, they achieved zero preventable deaths. So if one can do it, if all of us do it, we can get there. That's, that's great to hear. What collaborations do you hope to see in your future or even long term? Well, I, I believe uh, the collaboration that is missing is really the one that hopefully can be done by those who control the purse um, for healthcare. I think whether it's in the US, it's Medicare, or out of other countries, whoever is paying for the healthcare, they need to step up now because the choir is with us. We need everybody else to join this movement. And I think to do that, they could use the fact that they're paying for healthcare, or at least in our country, mm -hmm. over half of it, to demand 
every hospital implement evidence-based practices, demand every hospital report their harm quarterly in a public way. And I think those two items can get us pretty close to zero. Um, what do you envision as the future of healthcare? I believe we can get to a healthcare system that not only provides everyone access to healthcare, but it's a system that's dignified and it's safe by design. Uh, I also believe this push towards home, uh, monitoring people at home, telehealth, mm -hmm. telemonitoring, I think can hopefully create a safer place, a more dignified place for people to get most of their care. Now, they still have to go in for their procedures, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no reason uh, they need to go wait uh, to see the primary physician and then wait to get more testing done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then after their procedure, stay any longer than they need to. Once the ICU care period is over, step down can be delivered at home. And we are embarking on many initiatives at Massimo, my company that I started before I started the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, to hopefully provide some of those solutions. Um, especially recently, we hear a lot about AI. I wanted to ask what roles do you think AI and technology will play uh, in the field of healthcare and patient safety particularly? I think AIs can get rid of errors of omission. I think from here on, errors should be of errors of commission. There's a lot of good things that computers are really good at, and there's a lot of things they're not good at. One mm -hmm. thing they're good at is keeping track of data. Uh, it can be for hours, it could be for decades. So if we can have patients' data flow to these AI-based systems, whether it's while they're in the hospital or even their information from physician office visits to the, the technologies they'll have at home, I think AI can help warn clinicians of mm -hmm. impending doom. Uh, I think about Rory Staunton, who died of sepsis. Uh, he'd fallen in a gym, scuffed his arm, and unfortunately, um, he, he died of sepsis. But mm -hmm. before he died of sepsis, his parents took him to see his primary physician's office. And for his weight and size, his heart rate was really high. When he didn't get any better, he was still complaining about leg ache and throwing up. They took him to the ER. They did the blood work. His white blood cell counts were high. Now, imagine at that time you had AI-based systems that would have noticed a high heart rate, the high uh, white blood cell count. It would have sent a warning to the clinicians, maybe to even Rory's parents, that, hey, it could be sepsis. Doesn't mean it definitely is, but at least they would have not just ruled that out. Unfortunately, they assumed it was food poisoning or stomach flu, and Rory is not with us today. So AI, I think, could help a lot. Definitely. Well, this was a great conversation. Thank you so very much for your time, for sharing your insight and expertise, and also your vision with all of us. Thank you. Um, Thank you for this many... honor. Thank you. And I hope uh, we can collaborate, all of us together, until we're at zero, and we continue collaborating to keep us at zero. Thank you, and many congratulations again on your award. Thank you so much, Sanas.